Welcome to the Wasika Small Town Big Stories podcast, sponsored by ITRON and Bird's Eye Foods. I'm your host, Ann Fitch, the Executive Director of the Wasika Area Chamber of Commerce, where we promote business and enhance community. Today, we're joined at the Suburban Furniture Table by Terry Huber, the owner of Southside Marine and More. Welcome, Terry. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have you here at the table today. I'm pretty excited, too. A little nervous. <laughs> I know, and I'm so excited by that. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll go. We'll keep. We'll hang on to excited right now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, so, how long has it been since you've uh, purchased Southside Marine and more? Um, I purchased Southside Marine on September twenty second, so um, I've been at it for a couple months now. I love it, and you you have worked there previously, correct? Yeah, I started there actually September twenty fourth of twenty twenty. So I bought it almost three years after. Oh my gosh. Now you didn't just come into working for Southside Marine. Um, and now it's, and more because Terry Huber has purchased it. So now it's Southside Marine and more yes. because you are the, and more I wanted to, and I wanted to add the, and more because we're, when Neil started it, it was a lot of just Marine work, mm -hmm. but over the years we have brought on lawnmowers and generators and pressure washers and all sorts of other small engine work yeah and now since i've taken over we're doing a lot more snowmobile and four-wheeler work in the winter months here sure um, right now the shop's full of older snowmobiles because a lot of snowmobile dealerships don't work on the 1990s sleds anymore mm -hmm. they got like an age gap of we only work on this age group and they won't work on that older stuff anymore but there's a lot of people that still have that older equipment around that still need it worked on and need carburetor work done absolutely and that's really uh that's kind of your wheelhouse and your passion is snowmobiling side by sides and and that that kind of outdoor activity i mean the huber family has just been snowmobile nuts for as long as i've known the huber family yeah um i've been doing snowmobiles and outdoor activities for as long as I can remember. We had four wheelers growing up and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, now, uh, my wife and I are really the only ones that have snowmobiles. Um, my brother Tyler still has a vintage one and, uh, my brother Travis has a couple as well. And him and I are the ones that do a lot of snowmobiling together too, along with my wife. But, uh, as you get older, you start looking at snowmobiling as a little bit more painful. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite as fun, right? Right. When you have to when you have to recruit take... for a couple of days, it's not as fun as it used to be. Yeah, but... you need a couple more heating pads the, right. the next day. Right. But no, we're trying to uh, fill our shop with a lot of other stuff rather than the boats. Um, like I said, right now, if you walked into our shop, you can see lawnmowers getting worked on, snowmobiles getting worked on. Um, we actually got a gas powered air compressor in there that's getting worked mm. on right now. So that's kind of nice for a lot of construction guys to know that their gas powered equipment that they have for their projects can still get serviced oh. by someone in town. Um, once Ace Hardware closed their shop in town, we kind of lost a major small engine shop. Yeah. Closed their small engine repair shop. Yes. <clears throat> um, so... I kind of brought that up to Neil when it happened. We're just, I'm like, we should take this and kind of run with it mm -hmm. and bring on some some more small engine work. And when I started at Southside Marine, um, that was kind of my wheelhouse with small engines, snowmobiles, stuff like that. Yeah. I wasn't huge into the boat motors at that time, but like it was explained to me, it's no different than your snowmobile engine. It's just flipped. And it's like it's standing straight on end rather than how you would imagine it to be with the spark plugs on top. Mm -hmm. Instead, the spark plugs are on the side. So it's almost like you took and flipped the entire engine. And that's pretty much what an outboard engine is. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of similarities. Oh, interesting. So does it, so it doesn't take, a, I don't want to diminish the, the learning curve it takes, but um, if you know how to work on those snowmobile engines and those smaller engines, it's not a huge learning curve 
to work on the boat engines or tell me, tell me about that because I, if it's under a hood, um, I can put in some windshield wiper fluid. Um, I know where the dipstick is and I know how to change some spark plugs. So that's what I got in my there, knowledge. There's a lot more to a boat motor than the other motors as well. Um, but the, the biggest thing is, is like, for instance, a snowmobile engine has a clutch and then a boat motor has a drive shaft that comes up to the motor that goes down to your lower gear case. And you have all those components are bolted together. So it's not as easy as um, most of the time you can just unbolt a snowmobile engine and just pull it off. And if you were to like rebuild it, if mm -hmm. you were to rebuild the power head on an outboard, um, there's a lot more splitting things apart and more pieces to the puzzle because it's that's your whole unit. Your motor's not a separate you. Your motor's not just a separate unit sitting in a belly pan like on a snowmobile, or it's not a motor sitting underneath the hood on a lawnmower that's connected with belts and different things to make it go. It's a one whole unit that's bolted in different pieces together to make it go, basically. Huh. See, Terry, <clears throat> I love when you talk about this and when I sit in your office and you talk about all the things you have going on at Southside Marine, you are talking about it in a way that I can actually visualize it and it makes it easier to listen to. Uh, because when someone doesn't have that knowledge, uh, it, it is difficult. And so I do enjoy listening to you talk about it. I think it, the difference is, is because when I explain it, it's not textbook. Yeah. Because it's not something I went to school for. Yeah. It's all hands-on that I've learned it through the years. Um, I grew up on a farm, so there's a lot of hands-on learning when you're doing it as kind of a hobby and here and there um, on the farm. And then when I started at Southside Marine, um, the head technician, Adam, and Neil were basically my mentors, and they taught me everything I know as far as the boat motors go. And beyond that point as well because there's there's a lot of things that I don't know yet but I'm always eager to learn as I go along to see how I can broaden my horizons what what made you want to take the leap into ownership I mean you were you're were, you're working at Southside Marine you're enjoying it I know that Neil was gonna move on regardless but what made you say I'm I'm gonna buy this I'm, I'm going home to talk to my wife or I'm 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 buying Southside Marine. Um, I really when I started at Southside Marine, it wasn't really my. It was a job. Mm -hmm. I was, I was fed up with my other job, so I was kind of in, in between jobs at the time, and I saw they were looking. So I actually knew the head technician Adam at the time, and I kind of was texting him. I'm like, Hey, do you think this is something I should? apply for you guys think you have a use for me and he's like yeah why don't you come in and talk with neil and see see what he has to say he goes i'll i'll, I'll let him know what i think of you and because adam kind of knew me from uh asking him for help on some snowmobile projects as mm -hmm. i was a, I was as i was younger and growing up and so then i stopped in and talked to neil and we had like a five minute conversation in the office and then all of a sudden i was working and <laughs> it's just one of them, it's one of them small town things that it's just, it's just not a big uh, process to put everything mm -hmm. together. It's just like, yeah, I think you're going to work out fine here. But when I first started there and we kind of got into it, uh, I was just in hindsight, just kind of talking with Neil a little bit about like, hey, how long are you going to do this? planning out my future more than anything like yeah if neil closes his shop like what's my future am, am, am i gonna work for the next person um and at that time it was neil and adam and myself so i'm like i'm the youngest person here and adam was in his 40s at the time and neil's in his 50s and i'm like okay who else is going to be doing this in the future so period periodically like even in that first year i talked to neil about 
buying the place or just like what the long-term goal was for him and if he thought I'd be any good at owning a uh, Southside Marine. And um, we kind of talked with it about it, and he's like, yeah, probably five to seven years I'd think about retiring. And I'm like, oh, okay, because at that time um, it would have put me at like 33, 34 when he was thinking about retiring. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be fine because I could probably start at that moment and take it from there and put it, put enough years in it, into it uh, for me to have a retirement out of it. And then all of a sudden that five to seven years got knocked down to three years. And then it got knocked down to two years because obviously time is progressing yeah. as we keep talking about this. And then at one point it was January of 2023. He's like, we're going to do this. Um, this is my, Neil's like, this is my opportunity to kind of retire and, uh, take back a little bit. Uh, he had some health things going on, so he wanted to lessen his load. Sure. So I was pretty much, I went home, uh, talked with my pregnant wife about it <laughs> with our first, first baby. And I said, what do you think? And we yeah, kinda, what did Mrs. Huber think? Um, when we first talked about it, she was as well as I was, we're like, uh, we got a baby coming and we got some things we need to focus on here to get done first. Mm -hmm. Um, I talked about it before we got pregnant, um, with Amanda and, um, we kind of both came to the agreement that let's start our family first before we start a business type deal. And so then all of a sudden we got pregnant and then Neil kind of prodded me a little bit. And he's like, so what's your plan? What are we going to do? And so then I went home and talked to her again about it and we talked about it and she was very supportive. and was like, if this is what you want to do. And she goes, I can see your passion for it. And I think you're very good at it. So if this is something you want to do, I mean, we'll make it happen. So we were in process. I started all the paperwork and everything to make this happen January 1st, 2023. And then about Christmas time came around of uh, 22 and I walked into Neil's office. And I said, I, I just can't do this. And he goes, why? And I said, I don't know what it's like to be a dad. I said, I said, I've got something very new coming into my life right now. And I said, I just don't know if I can handle two brand new things at one time. And I said, can we just wait, make sure our pregnancy and everything goes good and <clears throat> we can, and then we can move on from there. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. I totally, mm -hmm. I totally understand that. So, so then we just kind of tabled everything because I had everything lined up with all the suppliers and everything. Sure. I, had my, I had applications in for everybody. And so now I redid my whole process again and yeah. was like, they're like, what do you want us to do? Cancel it? I said, is there any way that you can just push it over here for now? Yeah. So logistically <laughs> you were all set up for right. January 2023 purchase. Yeah. But December said, 22, you just I said, said you I got to. I got to push this out a little bit. Right. So I'm like, can you guys just push it in the corner of your desk? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. As long as you do it within the next year, then we don't have to redo anything. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, there's another timeline. Well, then time moved on. And then in February, um, our head technician, Adam, got a job offer. He couldn't refuse. So he was leaving. Oof. So now... Adam was a great asset to yeah. Southside Marine. Yes, he worked there for 17 years about. Sheesh. Um, taught me a lot. Um, was a great part of our of the team there. And um and I do miss working with him. I mean, we we really got along well. So then it kind of raised a red flag in the back of my mind. I'm like, "Okay, so now I take on a business. I lose Neil." And it's me. I, so 
because for a while there, it was just Neil and I, but it was actually just the two of us for a little, about a month and a half. Um, we ended up putting an Indeed post out there for a new small engine mechanic because with this role taking on, I was in the office more. I was doing more management stuff. Mm -hmm. I took on the new lead role because Adam had left and I was trying to get myself into that ownership mindset anyway on how to run things. And we posted for a new marine technician and a new small engine technician. And we got extremely lucky. Um, my small engine technician, Trevor, is right from Janesville originally, and he actually lives in Waseca. So it's just one of them things that you don't know someone's available until you start asking. Yeah. And that worked out really well. I mean, he, he loves the small engine stuff, the snowmobile stuff. Uh, and then he likes more of the old Johnson outboards. Yeah. With yeah. the points and condensers and everything like that. So he works, he like fits that slot perfectly. And then our marine technician, his name is Dennis. Um, he was actually applied for the job because he was moving up from Illinois. Dennis is originally from Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, and him and his wife lived in Illinois and he was actually a marine tech there. He's got all his master qualifications and everything through like Mercury. Wow. Um, and it was just a really lucky thing. They were moving up here because of his wife's job and he fits the Marine spot perfectly. So right now, and then once they started in March, I was just basically, they always joke with me when I walk through the shop. They're like, oh, here comes the supervisor. We better get back to work. Well, <laughs> I wasn't, I was in that supervisor type role, but I was doing um, service writing and parts ordering and talking with Neil in the office, getting trained on how to do ownership. Yeah, you were really ramping up right. to that ownership But they position. didn't know that. They didn't know I was taking ownership. Oh, so that was really because between you and Neil. It was just between us um, because they were brand new. Like we wanted, they were Neil's employees. Like, Okay. And then um, once we got into, because at this point things weren't extremely serious with ownership right now because we're only in March. And... Um, Moving forward, we ended up having our baby in May, and we have a son named Henrik. So I wanted to get have our baby first before I worried about the ownership right. change of anything. And then we had him and just went through normal life and then kept this in the back burner. And then 4th of July came around, and Neil's like, okay, it's, it's time to get serious if we're going to do this. Neil said, you've been a dad long enough. When are you going to buy this business? He's like, your feet, your feet are wet. Like, <laughs> he's like, if you don't know it by now, you're never going to know it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so then it was like, okay, start calling everybody and make things move here. And Neil's idea, along with mine, was our busiest time of the season is winter storage. So fall winterizing with boats is when we have the most uh, revenue coming into our business. Wow, okay. Um, so he's like, I want you to start on the top rather than, he's like, the more I think about it, the more I'm glad we didn't do this in January because yeah. we've been at slow time. So then we came up with, uh, okay, the 1st of September, we're going to close everything and then you're going to take over. Well, it's, you're never going to find a small town person that doesn't do their job right away. Sure. When you're dealing with a bunch of corporate yeah. people, it's harder to get everything done extremely right away. Mm -hmm. So then it got prolonged out until, okay, we're not going to be ready till September 15th. And then all of a sudden it was a little later. And then it's like, okay, we should have everything we need by September 22nd. Right. And then at July is when I told the guys, I said, hey, just so you know, I'm going forward with ownership of this place. And I said, nothing's going to change. You guys get to keep your jobs. Yeah. I said, it's just, you're going to see me a little less, so I won't be 
on your case as much and I'm yeah. going to be up front. And I'm like, it might even be better for you because right. I won't be breathing on you all the time. <laughs> and, and the two guys I got, Dennis and Trevor, have made this whole process extremely easy. I mean, they, they've picked up the slack where it needed to be picked up. They do part of what I used to do. Like they do some service writing and parts look up in themselves now because we try to all wear the hats just for the simple fact there's three of us. Oh, yeah, you have to have that cross-training in place right. when you don't have a huge staff. Right, so we try to we try to all do everything just so one person isn't burnt out. Mm-hmm. But like I said, them two each have their strong areas. So they Trevor's not going to volunteer to work on a boat, and Dennis isn't going to volunteer to work on a snowmobile. You know, like right. they know where their strong suits are, and they kind of stick and stick where they need to, um, but they will work in each area too. So, um, and then once I took on ownership, I, I actually hired another full time employee. Um, his name was Nathan, and he was a fresh graduate stu- kid that wasn't going to school, and his job was literally to wrap boats and put all that white wrap and shrink it on boats. Oh, nice. Which worked out really nice because he just did that full time. And then the guys could wrench full time and they weren't interrupted. Yeah. Because like when I first started, Adam and I would shrink wrap boats too. That's got to be uh, a cumbersome job that people don't think about because that 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 white shrimp wrap has got to get on those boats somehow right but it can't be an easy job no it's it's not necessarily hard right yeah but, not it's not it's not difficult but it, but but it, it is doesn't it doesn't seem it no but it doesn't seem like oh i can just flip this over and it just comes together real easily it doesn't take 10 minutes in my mind no it's it's a good hour yeah if, if you're good at it it should take you an hour to do a boat. If you're not, it takes you longer. Um, yeah. But you kind of got to know how hot to get it. Because if you get it too hot, then it just burns a hole through it. And then you got a big hole that you got to patch on the shrink wrap itself. So is it just like a uh, plastic it comes blanket up, that it, you throw over it and then you just use a hair dryer? That's what I envision. So it comes on a big roll. Um, and then it's on a cart and we got... 20 foot and 14 foot. So the 14 foot is yeah. like for your boat, the 20 foot's for your pontoon, and mm-hmm. that's the width of it. And then you drape it over the boat or the pontoon, and then you tie a cord around the bottom of it to cinch it. Okay. And then you want to make sure that cord is like under the corner of the deck of the pontoon, so it's it's hooked on something basically. And then you go around and you cut off all the excess. You make sure it's kind of pulled tight and yeah. laying flat. And then you go and cut all the excess around off of it, and you kind of leave like a six-inch section on it. And you heat that up and fold it up, and you pretty much make this cord into a pocket. Hmm. Like you would hem on a shirt. Okay. You know, it's it's like your your jog pants have a string in them. Yeah. It's a basic concept of it. And then once you do all that, then you have to cut slits and put tie-down cords onto like the trailer or underneath the boat. Because when you start heating it, it wants to shrink yeah. and pull up. Yeah. So you need to have it tied down so it doesn't pull up and pretty much undo what you your con, your basic concept is, is to protect it so you don't want it pulling up onto the sides. Huh. And then once you get all that tied down, then you just start heat shrinking it. But the the heat gun that we have, I mean, it throws a flame off, you know probably two foot span. Oh, geez. I mean, it's, it's it like fans out like a fan and then you just kind of heat it back and forth, but it's an open flame. Well, now I want to see this done next fall. It's, it's pretty entertaining. And, um, I always, always joke with the guys. Cause I said, what, whatever it is, you're not, you're not going to be as good at it as I am because for three years I wrapped a turtle slide at the water park. Oh yeah. And I said, you're never going to be turtle slide wrapping good, but no, I said, if you, yeah, <laughs> if you can wrap a turtle slide, man, I mean, and that's intricate we don't stuff. do, we don't do that anymore, but, uh, Neil did it the first year. Yeah. And then the next year he's like, Hey, go out and wrap that turtle for the city. 
And I'm like, how do you do it? And he goes, just put scuff tape on it and throw it over there and wrap it up. I, he's like, I can't explain it. Just you're just going to have to do it. And so I did it two years out there at the water park. <laughs> and it's not something we don't advertise that we're doing random things like that. Yeah. Um, because we like it's it's a hassle to take and do it outside sure. of the shop. Sure. Um, but it was just something kind of different and neat to do to uh, that's pretty cool i wrapped a turtle good for you um i did have a guy this year come in and he owns a lawn mowing business yeah and he doesn't have a shed for his equipment he's got a utility trailer and all of his equipment fits on his utility trailer Mm -hmm. and he's like could you wrap all this on my trailer so i could store it for the winter and i like a challenge so i'm like and anything like that, I don't ask the guys to do. I'm like, this is yeah, something I, Terry I, wants to do. I took on this challenge, and I want and I want ask them to do anything that I haven't done first, right? Because I've been in their shoes. So if if I know someone hasn't done it before, I want to make sure whoever's the boss of me has done it, you right? Know, type deal. So, um. So yeah, this guy brought his lawnmowers on this utility trailer and I built a frame on it and wrapped it up and it turned out pretty good. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> but it was, we get a lot of different questions about that shrink wrapping though. Um, people ask if we do campers Yeah. and like they want the roof of their camper done and it doesn't, the way we're, the way we are set up mm-hmm. doesn't work that way. Sure. Because if you were to wrap like the rough of a camper for instance with the with the size stuff we have the cord would be like in the middle of the camper yeah it wouldn't be at the bottom of it right so the wind would s- smack that against yes. the camper and rub paint off and stuff like yeah that. I said, so it just wouldn't i said it could be done they make shrink wrap that big i mean they make shrink wrap that covers like big utility like air compressors and stuff at right. big businesses um but i said we're just not set up for that and i i deny a lot of requests that i get too because i'm like we're just gonna stick to the boats but like the utility trailer thing was like it's close enough to the same thing that i can still accomplish it and if you can't make it look as the final product as good as you want it to look then then it's, you know, it's, right. it's hard to take on that, that challenge too. Right. I don't want to take something on that. I, do, I know for sure that I can't, like, mm-hmm. I want to be able to send it out the door yes. and I don't want to be waste all that time with it either and say, Hey, I wasn't able to get this done. Absolutely. Now you mentioned something that I think is very, very important, um, that I like to talk about. You had a son, Henrik. Yep. Let's talk about being a new dad. I think that that's really exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, it's literally been the best thing that's ever happened. Um, he's just so happy and go lucky all the time. Um, we actually didn't find out what we were having. Mm -hmm. And obviously every dad's dream is to have a little boy to like go play on the farm or Mm -hmm. work in the shop with type deal. And he came out a boy and it was just the best thing ever. And he was born on May 5th. And this name that we picked out for him, his full name is Henrik Trav Huber. Mm -hmm. And we've had that name picked out for five years. (laughs) So just a while. We we just had that name tucked in the, tucked aside forever. And we actually didn't come up with a girl name until about 36 weeks. Okay. We finally agreed on a middle name and a first name for a girl. And you'll keep that in the, and that's just going to stay, that's just going to stay in the folder. Possible another one. Everybody's like, well, can we hear that one? And no, I'm like, no, we're just going to keep that in the folder and we'll, we'll get to it someday. But the cool thing about Henrik is that was his name that we already had picked for him and no one knew it, but he was born on my brother Travis's birthday, and that's his middle name. That's great. So it was just kind of like the stars all aligned, and we got this little baby boy and his middle name, and gets to be the same as his godfather and uncle. And he's just he's just been the best thing that's ever happened to my wife and I, and mm-hmm. he's just a bundle of joy all the time. He, uh, 
we've done a lot of things with him this uh, summer and fall. But he's like got a favorite toy, and he got a set of he got a set of wrenches. Okay. They're teething wrenches, but they look like little box end wrenches and stuff like that. And those are his favorite. And it's just it's just funny because um, I had uh, Nick here at Small Town Media mm-hmm. make my logo and all my clothing and stuff. And I actually handed him like three onesies and he printed my logo on all of them. So awesome. He had career day at daycare one day. So he's got a picture. It's actually my screensaver on my computer, but nice. it's a picture of him in his Southside Marina Moore shirt and he's holding his wrench and it's, that's his, it's his training day for when he gets to take over Southside Marina Moore. That's fantastic. <laughs> Already ready for second generation. Right. Yeah, well, I, f- I figure I'm like, okay, I took it over at 30, 30 years, I'll be 60, I can retire then. Yes, yeah, <laughs> Henrik should be, he should be ready in 30 right. years. Right, he'll be yes. 30, just like me, so we'll be, we'll be re- set and ready to go. That's awesome. <laughs> That's fantastic. Gosh, you're only 30, Terry. Yeah. And you own a business. Yeah, I've, I've done, I've done a lot of different things so far. Um, obviously, this is my biggest yeah. job that I've done, but not really what, uh, what I thought my career path was going to look like. What led you here? What, what have you done up to this point? Um, when I was in high school, I did YSL. Um, the youth service leadership. Yep. Yep. And I would leave and, uh, I went to Hansel and Gretel daycare. Okay. For YSL. And the teachers there are like, have you ever thought about being a teacher? I said, no. I said, I don't even, I'm in high school. I don't know what I want to do. Right. Right. <laughs> And they're like, well, I think you should find a job in it and see if you enjoy it. And I'm like, all right, but sure. <laughs> Go with the flow in high school. You know, you just, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I ended up being done with the YSL program. I got into the work leave program at high school and I got a job at school age care, daycare through community education. Mm-hmm. And I worked in the preschool room and as a junior in high school and then that went into camp cool and worked a summer program and then did that for a couple years and then all of a sudden I was like a staff leader I as I got older um my boss made me like staff leader like you make sure people get their breaks kind of check in with room see if they're staffed okay and instead of you being more in charge of a classroom of students, I was more in charge of making sure everybody was covered in what they needed to do. So I did that for, oh boy, a long time ago. I did that from 2010 to 2016. Oh, wow. Um, so six years I worked at school age care and camp cool. And I did that. And then while I was doing that, I graduated in 2012 and I went to school for child development to be a preschool teacher. And then school age care had a before and after school program and then the preschool room. So I kind of wanted to find something to do during the daytime. So I would do before school. Then I go work in the therapeutic program at the WIS. And I did that for three years and worked with, um, with, uh, kids there that, had learning disabilities or anger issues and um, did that for quite a while. And that was, that was a very, it was a very hard job, but it was a very rewarding job um, making an impact in the youth like that. And then my student that I had, I had one student that I worked with as a paraprofessional um, while I was doing my schooling and working school age care and I had him through fourth grade through sixth grade. And mm-hmm. by the time he was in sixth grade, I mean, he was pretty self-sufficient. He didn't really need me that much. I kind of got pulled away to other kids as yeah. well. But it was it was just nice to see progress and know you had a part in making a kid's life a little easier for them yeah. or better for them. Yes. So, and then after that, I got asked to come to Team Academy Um and I did Team Academy's therapeutic uh, program for a year. And at when I went to Team Academy, I actually quit at 
uh, doing school age care and WIS, obviously, because I was working for team. Mm -hmm. And I did their before and after school program at team and then did paraprofessional work during the day. And then I didn't have... I didn't have all the uh, degrees to go further with that. I needed to go back to school for like K-12 sure. if I wanted to get to that next grade of pay and everything like that. And then I was like, well, I don't know if this is exactly what I want to do. Um, I really, truly enjoyed it. But at the same term, I also enjoyed tinkering. And mm -hmm. I, did I did maintenance at Team Academy too for that year that I was there. And I enjoyed that kind of work too. So I was more apt to, I want to buy a house. I'm at that age now. I want to buy a house. I need the money to do this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just got to make a difficult decision. It's like, okay, how am I going to find a happy median to where I want to be? Right. So then I ended up going and working for Waseke County Building Grounds and Parks Maintenance. Yeah. And I did that for four years. Yeah. And that allowed me to... You had a little more money, and I true I still enjoyed. I did small engine work there mm -hmm. and maintenance on the parks equipment and building stuff as well. And i i did en I did enjoy that job, but it wasn't it wasn't exactly for me. You know, sure. it, it helped me get to that point that I needed to be, so I could buy my first house and move and do all that. Yeah, there was a lot of value to that job. Mm -hmm. And then. So, and then at that point, I just was kind of like, I don't know if this is what I want to do. And Amanda's like, well, why don't you take some time off, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I, I put in my resignation at the county and then I was just home. I worked on our farm a little bit and kind of trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do in life. And then that's when... I actually uh, applied right away for the Southside Marine job, and they had already filled it. Mm. And that person, it wasn't for them, so they were only there for like three weeks. Oh, gosh. And then it came up again, and then that's when I got into the door there. But, yeah, it's it's been definitely a journey of different things. And, I mean, there's been a lot of high school jobs and stuff like that, but career-wise, yeah. that's what I've, you know— done how great to have a supportive wife to just say just, just take the time and figure it out right you know it my my wife's motto always is is it'll always work itself out mm -hmm. and i am learning to learn that phrase a little bit more mm -hmm. i really struggle with it towards the beginning but um she's right it doesn't matter what the case might be. It always works itself out. Terry, I want you to know that this podcast lives on forever, and you just said she's right. <laughs> so I just I just want you to know. Hey, I've said it before okay. because All right. it happens. <laughs> this is this is any man that denies it is not living in reality. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Huber has spoke for. Most men, so there you go, guys. She's right. That's if you take nothing else away from this podcast. <laughs> you got to be a realist sometimes. <laughs> so, Terry, I know that, uh, like we talked about before, you're you're a big snowmobile guy, um, and I'm not going to make you um, alienate any of your customers by talking about which um, brand you prefer, even though I know which brand you prefer. Is there a huge difference when working on snowmobiles so if someone brings you one brand versus the other, um, is there one you're just like, ah, this one's kind of a real pain in the rear to work on, or are they kind of the same? It depends. Um, to be honest, the brand I prefer is the Herders Husky, okay. which is a Wasika brand. Yes. And the reason for it, it's from the 1970s. There's nothing too fancy about it. Mm -hmm. And I can work it. You got all this room underneath the hood to do everything with. There's nothing crazy to do. The newer you get, the more compact and complex they get. So oh, yeah. we don't really tend to take on a lot of new new sleds. Yeah. Unless they need something like mechanical, like a 
ski fixed, ski alignment. But if it has a running issue, you're going to have to go to a licensed dealer that Got has it. the programs to do so. Um, so you're looking at like 2000s and older? Uh, not not even. Um, I mean, we, we or still... Or true, true vintage. No, we can still work on... Newer than 2000. I oh, mean, okay, okay. We got some 2016, 2000. Well, for instance, we just had a 2019 um, XF 1100 Articat come to mm, the shop. Okay. And that's a four stroke engine. Now, the difference between a four stroke and a two stroke. It's two strokes. Um, well, it's most. <laughs> I just could not. I, I'm sorry, Terry. I just. I, that's, I get it. That's, that's I get my, it. That's Daryl Vilt math coming but, through from Wasika High School. But in in layman's terms for it, it's a lot of people don't understand that. And especially in boat motor world, too. If yeah. you're talking to someone on the phone, they're like, well, I don't know. Yeah. And the way they describe it is they're like, well, I have to put oil in the gas. So it's like. That's a two-stroke motor. Okay. If you have to mix oil with the gas, or if you have to put oil in a separate little jug that mixes with the gas, that's a two-stroke motor. It needs a two-stroke oil. I feel like I should have known these things when I owned my snowmobile. <laughs> so, and then, like, this newer sled is a four-stroke model, so that takes oil like your car would. Got it. It You put the oil into it, and then it it's always in there. And then it runs on gasoline. So we we do an oil change on one of them. So I mean we can we can do that. Got it. But if it comes in and it's flashing a code or whatever like this, we don't have the computer system to figure that out. Somebody should just call ahead if they want their sled right. on. Yeah. That's easiest. That way I c- and that goes for a lot of things. Um spe- especially with the marine world too is we get a lot of phone calls that guys are like, "Hey, I got a jet ski. We don't work on jet skis." No. <clears throat> jet skis are a pain in the butt to work on. Yeah, and that's one of the very, very few things you will not work on as a jet ski. Yes, very yeah. few things, and one, yep. and that's about the one and only thing that will say, "Hey, we're yeah. just not going to touch it." Um, they're just not. They're not enjoyable to work on, and they're they're very hard. You almost have to become a contortionist to get, like, if you need to get a starter out of one. A lot of times you pretty much got to twist your arm in five mm. different ways in order to get it out. So that is the one thing that we just don't tend to do. So, so if the customer has questions, just call and yep. call and see what you guys are working on. And and there's things out there as well that they don't have parts for either. Oh, I'm sure. So, I mean, it's always good to call ahead and say, hey, this is what I got. And then I can say, yeah, we can work on it. But sometimes I might say, yeah, we can work on it, but this is as far as I can go with it because they don't make any parts for it. Um, for instance, one guy had a uh, a Nissan boat motor, um, late 70s year. It's just very hard to get parts for it. Yeah. Not necessarily impossible, but just very hard. And I pretty much told the customer right away, I said, I'm going as far as cleaning the carburetor on this, but that's a about as far as we're going to go because that's about all you're going to get done but he's happy to hear that because the last five places he called in the surrounding area said no oh geez you know we're about the only marine shop around that still touches that 1970s era boat motor nice or, or even snowmobiles in that aspect too because your snowmobile places in Oatana and Mankato aren't going to cover a lot of that vintage stuff as well. Wow, wow, wow. I actually had a guy drop off a 1993 Articat snowmobile that needed carb work done. And he told me, going off the customer's mm-hmm. word, that he called an Oatana and they told him they won't work on it anymore. It's out of their 20, 20 five, year span or whatever. 20 year yeah. span or whatever that they mm. have. And I suppose as a licensed dealer, you have to put a cap on something sure. because you don't have enough um, people or time to get yep. all of them done. So I'm sure you got to make that cap of some sort. But sure, my guys like that carbureted machine myself as well. I mean, it's just easier to work on it because you're not trying to figure out 
electronics with yeah. fuel injected and everything like that. Yeah. And like you said, you like working on it. Right. Uh, you know, it's not, and it's not just the motors you guys work on. I mean, I've in, in your showroom, the, the amount of ice fishing stuff and bait and tackle and you do the, you fill LP tanks out yeah. there too. So it just truly the end more of Southside Marina more is not just uh, a name brand change. It's not just a gimmick. You really no, do have and more out there. No, it's definitely more things offered to the public um we brought on the bait and tackle like two two years ago now uh, we brought the bait and tackle on and the lp fill station mm -hmm. and this last year we brought on um a whole line of battery operated e hand yeah. equipment like yes. leaf blowers and snow blowers um because that battery world is happening oh yeah you know people are getting to the point where they just rather deal with the batteries than try to monkey around with the gas and the oil and they're more powerful than they ever were yes i mean if you if you bought, bought some of this battery operated 10 years ago and you're like ah this this leaf blower is weak it's not the case anymore holy cow and what we carry is called Cress. it's a german engineered brand and it's a 60 volt system and it's more of a commercial grade mm -hmm. system um rather than your that rather than your DeWalt's and your Milwaukee's that you buy in the box stores and mm -hmm. wherever you get those from, um, it's just a it's just kind of a different um, level as far as what the machines are. Um, we took a chance at them, um, and everybody I've sold to has been extremely happy with them. Uh, I do have some new things I'm really excited about this spring. Um, I got robot lawnmowers coming. What? So Crest put an antenna on my building, and that will cover a 10-mile radius. And that radius is meant to grow as people buy it. Yeah. Um, Crest will always be looking for a way to network, um, just like anything else. But you can get up to a 9-acre robot lawnmower, and you can train it and program it to get out and cut your lawn. If, it's ra if it detects rain when it comes out, it'll put itself back away. That's if you so don't want cool. it to cut in the rain. Um, I've talked to a couple people about it. They're super excited. They really want to see them. So I'm hoping this spring to have one set up. And I'm just going to have it uh, mow the lawn at Southside. And yeah. watch, watch people drive in the ditch as they're watching this <laughs> robot yeah, mow the lawn. No kidding. <laughs> That's so, so neat. It'll give me some entertainment. I'll get yes. to watch a robot, watch people go, drive in the ditch. I mean, it, yeah. It, we don't want a, people no, driving no, in the No, no, don't ditch. drive in the ditch. Maybe just, maybe just swing in the <laughs> Swing into the parking lot and look at it that way. Look at it that way, yes. Um, yes. But I'm pretty excited about that. I mean, it's it's a way of getting with the times, basically. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the future. That's so cool. It's your outdoor Roomba. Right. And then we and then we actually lost our snowblower, snowblower line this last year. So I, once I took over... They just announced that they dropped a the line. Wow. And I'm like, oh, well, what am I going to bring? You yeah. know, like I have to have snowblowers yeah. because I offer that service to people. So I ended up finding uh, another manufacturer that I dealt with that is actually partnered with Generac, and I already carry Generac generators yeah. and pressure washers. Um, it's called DR um, Power Equipment. And they're all through the same uh, umbrella company, basically. And they actually came out this year with a snowblower, and I was like, thank you. I needed... Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Needed I, needed, I needed a snowblower line. So, um, And they are pretty much exactly the same as the Simplicity line that we were carrying. They got heated hand grips. They got steering oh, control. Nice. So if you're not the strongest person in the world, you're like, oh, I can't, I can't work a snowblower. Well... This snowblower helps you steer it, and it's got heated hand grips to keep you warm out there. So, I mean, it's it's a nice snowblower to to utilize. Good for you. Good for us. Yeah. I mean, it, I'm excited about it. Terry, I think you're just doing a great job with Southside Marine and More. I know you've only owned it for a couple months as of this podcast. Um, just to have you buying a business in the community as a young entrepreneur is fantastic. As a young dad, as a young husband, it's a lot to take on and you're doing just a fantastic job and maintaining that beard is also something to be commended. I can't grow it up top, so I got to grow it on my face. I know. I know you got you to grow it where you can, man. 
And, uh, but, but truly it's just, uh, the service that it is to the community and really Southern Minnesota is, um, is fantastic. And thank you for buying Southside Marina more. Um, having someone local own it is more important than you realize. Neil did a fantastic job with that business. And so to see someone else come in and buy that from our community is just, um, it's fantastic. And it, it would have been, it would have been great to have someone else buy it too, but it's even better to have, uh, someone from the community by it. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. No, thank you. It's been, been great so far. I just, I'm happy with the way everything's been going. Everybody's been very supportive. That's awesome. And I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a good winter for you. It's going to be a great summer when the campers start flooding in. And, uh, yeah, we're just, I know the community was just psyched to see somebody local buy it. So yeah. that was, uh, you, you did a service to the community, Terry. Well, I, uh, I don't look at it as that. I just look at it as something I love to do, and the community is very supportive of my business. So Good. that's it's nice to have them. And you and grew up here too. So what what is it like to be able to to be able to work in your hometown? I I love it. Um, I've never once thought about leaving Wasika. This is this is my home. This I know you get you break out in hives when you leave the county. Yeah, I just I I can stay here. Um, Actually, when my wife and I first started dating, I, we got it probably on our second or third date. And I said, so where are we going with this? Because I said, if you won't move to Wasika, we're, uh, this, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. And she, and she lived in Janesville. And I'm like, it's not oh, that far. Oh, wow. So far away, Terry. <laughs> so far away. But she, she's like, I, I didn't. I didn't I don't really, I didn't really want to move to Wasika. And I said, that's fine. I said, but if you want all this, I said, <laughs> you're going to have to move to Wasika. If you want all of this, <laughs> says Terry. <laughs> you got to throw an embarrassing term out yes, there. Yes, absolutely. Um, and she understood that. I, I'm a fourth, fourth generation that's lived on our family farm. Yep. Um, my middle brother is the one running and living on that farm right mm -hmm. now. And to be honest, between my parents and my three brothers, we're all within three miles of each other. Yeah. Um, I always kind of thought I would take on the farming aspect too. Mm -hmm. So I never really thought about leaving Wasika because I was just going to farm sure. with my brother. But I didn't really get into the crop thing as much as he did yeah i was more into the animals i really liked all the animal concept mm -hmm. of it and i always wanted to have my own country place farm mm -hmm. um and it just so happened that in 2018 two months after we got married we stumbled onto a place just through conversation that's literally two miles from the home farm oh my gosh so <laughs> it oh worked, my gosh it worked out really nice um finding something so close and local and now for the business concept it works really nice having a country farm place i still have our animals out there um we ran a rescue farm or we're still kind of running mm -hmm. a rescue farm um i'm just not taking on anything new anymore because my plate's pretty full <laughs> yeah oh yes um so now we have that opportunity to store all those boats out at our country property as yes. well yes um something new to look at when you look out the window and see all the clouds sitting out there. Yes. <laughs> it's like you're living in the clouds when you see all the pontoons wrapped out, <laughs> out in the yard. But no, it's uh, it's been great. Wasika's just a very supportive town, obviously. Um, when people ask about Wasika, they're like, well, what, what can you tell me about it? I said, you're not going to find a tighter knit community that supports you through everything. And I said... We've went through a lot of different battles in Wasika, which makes us stronger as a town. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good thing that we've mm -hmm. had to go through these different battles in Wasika, but um, it there's just so much support through the community. Um, so it, it, I just I really appreciate owning a business in this town because I just couldn't imagine seeing myself anywhere else. I guess. I love it. I love it. And like I said, we're, we're, we're just so pleased that you're doing it here. You're owning a business here. 
Uh, before we wrap up, Terry, we asked everybody the same question. Back when you were 17, before uh, little Henrik entered the picture, before reality, before Amanda, before anything, before you had responsibilities, what did you think you were going to do with your life? What did you think you were going to do? I honestly don't know. Um, probably thought I'd be, at that time, I probably thought I'd be teaching and doing something farming related, mm -hmm. which still doing something farming related and still teaching just in a different way. Now I teach my nephew everything he needs to know about engines. You there know, you go. like so there's always something to be taught anywhere in life. So there you go. See you're still doing everything you thought you'd do at seventeen and a whole lot more. Try to keep that more aspect. Absolutely. Always more. <laughs> always more. Thank you so much for joining me today, Terry. This no, has been thank awesome. you for having me. This has been great. This is so cool. Isn't it though? Yeah. This is so cool. I love it. Yeah, I love it too. It's awesome. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Bird's Eye Foods and iTron. Without them, it would not be possible to tell the big stories of our small town. And thank you to our production team, Small Town Media and Production. Join us next time for another episode of Wasika Small Town Big Stories.